beating me to death for years. Um, my government laptop doesn't fit <laughs> on the podium. It's a beautiful thing. Um, okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you a little bit about uh, um, actually a system that's being put in place by the Integrated Ocean Observing System. That's that little banner over on the left. And I work at the USGS, but my time has sort of been uh, donated. Uh, it's a contribution to IUS. A lot of people think of IUS as a, a NOAA thing, but it's actually a, a collaboration between federal agencies and state and local governments and academic institutions. And what's, what's showing up here on the screen right here is actually the, um, it's, a, it's a shot from an IPython notebook um, where we're actually accessing data from an ocean forecast model in New England uh, through a web service and then, uh, and then plotting it up in Matplotlib. And this is actually the forecast uh, ebb currents in Boston Harbor uh, about half an hour from now. And uh, the color is depth and the length is the, uh, of the arrows is the velocity. But, and, so the, and, and so the goal of this whole thing is to, is to make it easier for people who aren't, actually easier for modelers and for people who aren't modelers to get at the data from, these, uh, from all these ocean models that are running and to, to be able to dip in. And just, just as we heard in the IRIS project, that's, and this is sort of, uh, IRIS is part of that uh, ecosystem, as you'll see in a second. So, um, so just what is IUS? Actually, it's 11 different regions around the, the U.S. Uh, it's 17 different uh, regional associations. Um, sorry, <laughs> 11 regional associations, 17 agencies, and this is part of it, a larger international effort as well. And in each of these regions, there's a bunch of different ocean models running and a bunch of different data being collected. And so IUS has this problem, how do we integrate all this information? Uh, Emilio back there is from the Nanus region up there uh, in the Pacific Northwest. You can ask him about IUS too. Um, but you know, this is the problem that they uh, had in the beginning, uh, these different regions. This is in the Northeast region. There were two different uh, academic institutions running two different forecast models. And this is the Gulf of Maine here. And this is a zoom in to this Massachusetts Bay over here. They were running uh, forecasts in the same region. This is the same day, actually, the same variable temperature. And yet, uh, to compare the data, actually to get the data was a little bit of a challenge. You know, they had a funky sort of web interface here and another funky web interface here. And, you know, you couldn't plot stuff on the same scale. So, you know, clearly, you know, we're, we're trying to solve, get away from this problem and go to a standardized solution. And IUS has an architecture that is based on web services. So they say, okay, if you have observations or models, you're a data provider, you provide a web service, and they specify which are sort of approved services for the, to, to be used to go to the customer, or actually more likely a client built for the customer. And they didn't invent their own services, of course. They used services that were around uh, either OGC services. So in the case of in C2 data, the OGC SOS service, sensor observation service, which uh, gives you back XML or, uh, uh, or CSV, and, uh, and then uh, for gridded data, uh, gridded data, which is what I'm going to uh, sort of focus on, it's opened up with climate uh, CF conventions, as you just heard about, and uh, delivered through, uh, and then so the encoding is, is the opened app uh, binary format. So this is a, a service for delivering uh, the data that, was, that uh, Phil was just talking about, but through a service. So you can extract little pieces of data from these, you know, hundreds of gigabytes or terabytes of data. data. And so, and then for images of data, uh, the uh, web map service. Okay, so uh, so the thing is that um, you know in the in the coastal ocean we have these uh, we have these weird sort of uh, grids. We don't have regular, well we do have some regular grids, but a lot of the times they end up being these sort of curvilinear. Gr uh, whoops, um, I have to be gentle with the mouse here. Uh, curvilinear uh, grid, and and, and then. We have these weird vertical coordinates, which are not fixed levels in Z, but they, are, they stretch from the surface of the ocean to the bottom. And not only that, they go up and down with every time step as the sea surface goes up and down. So this is something that is you know, a little challenging for just generic packages, like you think about something like GDAL. It's really good at converting raster formats and stuff. But how do you convert stuff that looks like this? And this is where the CF conventions come in. Um, and then we have these unstructured grids with these triangular meshes that are being used more and more because they can represent the, co the complicated coastline uh, geometry and bathymetry in a way that uh, you can really focus down on the regions that you're interested in without uh, influencing the rest of the grid. So we have these sort of challenging types of uh, grids, but you know they're, they're actually you can represent them in a standard way through the CF conventions and for um, 
And, and so this is what's been developed in the climate community, and we're just using them in the ocean. Okay, so they provide a way of saying, okay, if you put in certain uh, attributes into your net CDF file or as in, into your data set, you can, uh, there's like an equation for calculating the vertical coordinate, things like that. And for the unstructured grids, uh, it's not in CF yet, but we have a draft um, standard that we've been working on with a bunch of the different groups that produce this kind of output. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more tomorrow in our uh, sprint or BOF or whatever we're going to call it. So if you're interested in that stuff, please join us. So this is what the sort of whole picture that IUS is, uh, the sort of architecture that IUS is implementing. Uh, you have a whole bunch of different models uh, over here that are producing different kinds of net CDF files or GRIB files. Jesus. <laughs> uh, maybe I'll just, I, I, I should point here, shouldn't I? Okay, so, um, and then the, uh, so these are non-standard uh, net CDF files that maybe don't meet the CF conventions, okay? And so, but what Unidata has done uh, through this Threads data server, and this is just something you can drop on a Tomcat server, is that it allows you to specify this uh, NCML here. Um, and this layer is just uh, XML that uh, you can use to add these attributes that make your data CF compliant, okay? So the model producers can keep producing the model output that they like to produce, and then you just have this light XML layer that basically standardizes their data. And once it's been standardized, so it becomes part of this, it goes into this common data model, common description of all these different kinds of models, and once it's in there, then it can be delivered through a bunch of different services. So it can be delivered through OpenDAP and CF with CF conventions, or it can be, if it, if it fits WCS, it can be delivered that way, or WMS for images, uh, and there's other services like NetCDF subset for people who just want a subset, and then there's this NC ISO service which actually takes the uh, metadata from the data set and delivers that as an ISO metadata document. So from there, you can go to, you know, uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. um, <laughs> I'll try to learn to be gentle. Um, you can go to uh, the different clients then that consume those services, okay? So um, we've spent actually a lot of time up here in the MATLAB, um, in the, I'm just going to point, <laughs> in, the, in the upper right um, with MATLAB because actually about 80% of our community, actually that's what they use. And so we've spent a lot of time up there and actually MATLAB can take advantage of NetCDF Java, which is a, uh, a library that's produced by Unidata that understands this common data model. Okay, so we can actually build <clears throat> a tool there that then consumes all these different models in an interoperable way. Okay, and down on the bottom here, um, the ISO metadata can be consumed by these uh, catalog services like GeoPortal Server or GeoNetwork, GICAT or CCAN. All of those things ingest data and then allow the data to be searched uh, through catalog services. Okay, and then, and then okay, so in a NetCDF for Python, um, can, can consume OpenDAP as well as, uh, you know, local NetCDF files, as Phil talked about, but it can also, with the very, with the exact same interface, access OpenDAP. So you just open a URL instead of a, a local file name, and you can be working with remote data. And so from there, as you heard, you can go to Iris, um, and you can also go into ArcGIS, um, because ArcGIS now has a, has a nice Python binding. And then, of course, you can go to the, to the notebook and things like that. So uh, in MATLAB, we have this, actually we spent a lot of time with this. Alex Crosby, who you heard from yesterday, if you were in this room, um, uh, has actually did a lot of the work on this to, if, so you can actually just point a URL and you give it a variable name and you get back a, uh, two objects, one which is the data structure, in this case the 3D data structure and, um, of the data, and then a geo object which contains the uh, latitude, longitude, Z, and time. So this is like the MATLAB, um, what, what Phil just talked about, a way to unambiguously determine all the, the coordinate variables and get back this object, and, and it works the same way in all these, these different models, okay, because they meet the CF conventions. Um, and in the MATLAB toolbox, so you can compare these different model results now. You can just say, let's see model one, model two, let's the, look at the data. You can compare them all using the very same routine and see that, you know, in this case, model one, you might want to find out what's going on in the boundary conditions here, okay? But we also have some other uh, routines like that we, um, where you say there's a glider path that's going along the coast. This is an instrument going up and down through the water column. And you want to sample the models in the same way 
you can, you can actually use a function here inside the toolbox to slice through, this is the data on the top, and then to take this arbitrary slice through these different models, okay? So this is great, you know, for MATLAB users, they love it, but it's sort of sad to tell folks you gotta use MATLAB in order to do this cool stuff, right? So we wanna be able to do this in Python. So we have Iris. I only found out about this uh, about four months ago, but I've been using it ever since. It is a great tool. And so, yeah, as, as Phil said, you can, load a, you can load a URL here on the top. Um, so I've gone to uh, open DAP link. You can, like I said, same as a local file. Get back the cubes, the variables, load it up, plot it. It's like four lines. And does it work for our, so this is a wave model from NSEP. Does it work for our uh, IUS data? Yep, uh, this is the global RTOS model from NOAA. This is a, a model that we run at the USGS. This is the Espresso model from Rutgers. This is the Sencus model from U UC Santa Cruz. This is the PAC IUS model from University of Hawaii. They all just work with the same, with the same routine. And uh, okay, so that's data access. Now I'm gonna, so we also want browsing. You know, we want, uh, this, the thing we care about the most is getting the data, but it's kind of nice to be able to browse as well. So um, this is browsing that's built in with threads, uh, this NCWMS. It works for structured grids. It doesn't work for unstructured grids, but for unstructured grids, if you were yesterday, you heard Alex talk about SciWMS, which is actually a Python uh, service that you can, here we're looking at it in open layers. You can see the little triangles down here. So that's for unstructured grid data. And now search, uh, searching, so people say, oh, this is awesome, you have these thread servers, you have this data, well, how do you find this stuff? Okay, so this is a schematic for actually for GI Cat, but it's really the same for GA Portal, Geo Network, or CCAN. Um, this is a little bit, this is the sort of the reverse of the figure I had before where um, actually over here are all the things you're consuming metadata from, okay? So these, these services, so this GI Cat harvests from a bunch of different services like CSW, um, from the o OWS, which is the, okay, so WMS service or SOS. Here it's harvesting from uh, OpenDAP. And so you can either harvest or you can access the, the services directly. You pull the data into a database. Okay, so you've harvested from all these different places that are serving data. You've, you've got the metadata into database and then you can access the, the database through these, again, through these services called, like OpenSearch or the CSW, uh, CSW service which is an OGC service, okay? So how do you do that in Python? Well, um, you can uh, use OWSlib, okay? And it's just been um, upgraded by Ky uh, Kyle Wilcox, who, is, who was the author of a talk yesterday that Alex gave. <laughs> um, and you can query, so you can query this, you can query for data on space, time, and keywords. Um, look like with something like this, you say, uh, you import um, catalog service web, and then you import this filter, um, uh, filters, then you give it a, the CSW endpoint, uh, and then in this case I'm giving it a bounding box and a date range and a, and a property that I want, see surface temperature, see water temperature, and then in the next line I'm saying, uh, okay, give me, you know, give me the standard name, but, and then the next line after that is, I want all the data sets that have opened up data endpoints, because that's what I can work with. And you, and you can put these in, you put this in as a, a list in this get filtered records uh, query, and what you get back are those OpenDAP uh, data endpoints, which we can then plug directly in to Iris uh, or to you know, other applications that, are, that can consume OpenDAP. That's pretty cool. So, um, you know, and then, okay, so and actually in this, this is part of a notebook that if you look at my gists, you can find this notebook. So then I go just loop through the, the, uh, the OpenDAP URLs that I, I pulled back using pandas. Uh, to, to plot up the data. This is just showing so that, so you know, this is just pulling three data sets that, we, that match those query criteria um, of time series. And what we're using this for is to locate all the observational data that fall within a model domain so we can compare the model to data. So unstructured grids, um, <laughs> well, we can plot them up in, in Python. Um, you know, I like this plot here. Um, and we can also, um, but we, you know, we actually, at this point, we, uh, we don't have anything more sophisticated than that. Um, so we need a common data model uh, for unstructured grids in Python, and, I, and we'd love for that to take place in Iris. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit tomorrow, too. But before I, um, before I finish here, I just wanted to say that, you know, 
Also, a lot of our folks want uh, their information in ARC uh, GIS, you know, for the emergency responders and the environmental planners, they're all using ARC. And uh, the Python interface, again, gives us a way of taking the data from OpenDAP into ARC. In this case, um, we're importing NetCDF4 again, okay, so we're, um, we're going to use the, uh, we're going to point at that URL, uh, point at a URL, just open it up, extract some data, and then use ArcPy, ArcPy's NumPy array to raster to just bring that chunk right into ARC and display it. That's pretty powerful, that, but that works for, you know, that works for gridded data. If you have these uh, curvilinear grids, currently, you're pretty much, as far as I know, limited to writing shape files, essentially. So this is an example of doing the same thing, pulling a chunk of data and then representing it as a shape file. So we've just basically coloring polygons and we've got arrows in the polygons. Um, but if you have, but, and you can do this for curvilinear data, but for, for unstructured grid data like this, actually you can use the, uh, the ArcGIS TIN, for, TIN format um, and so it took us a while, but we eventually figured out how to um, how to import uh, how to to read the, the data from OpenDAP, and then we write a land XML file, and then we use ArcPy land XML to tin to bring in the topology of this uh, unstructured grid array. And so that way we maintain the data on the on the uh, native model grid, and that's really important for these types of grids because you don't want to go to some raster which is going to either lose precision of the results or be way too much data to handle. This is a 30 terabyte data set. If we tried to represent this on uh, in a uniform grid at the smallest grid resolution, forget about it. <laughs> so this gives them a... T <laughs> or both. <laughs> or both. But so what this does though is it gives the managers, the people who paid for this data, a way that they can sit there and arc and they, can, and they can load up a little bit of data in, on the native grid like this, and then they can drill into the region they care about, in this case, say, Boston Harbor, and then use ARCS tools to go from the tin to the raster. And then in the, when they get to the, so they can do the raster at high resolution just in the place they care about for the time period they care about, and then they can do whatever they want. So in summary, um, you know, these, these tools are, um, they're doing a lot of useful work right now. Um, and so, you know, please let folks know who should be doing this, to, that they could be, or they could, could be doing this, who could benefit from this about, it, about this uh, approach. Um, there's still some rough parts for sure. Uh, the common data model for unstructured grid, um, handling trajectories and profile data, we have common data models for that, um, but we don't really have the tools yet uh, inside these packages to really make full use of that. And I think in IRIS it would be, I know you guys are just starting to work on the vertical coordinates, um, but eventually, I'm sure you're, you're going to be interested in this, you know, in the slicing, and maybe we can give you our slicing routine, you know, thing, we can work together to hopefully uh, make that work for the community. And so, you know, and, and the hope is, you know, we, by building better tools, um, we get more people using the model output, but we also almost always get better models because when people who know about the ocean start being able to look at the model output, they go, hmm, that looks a little uh, odd there, you know, and, uh, and that gets back to the modelers. The modelers should realize they've got something to work on. They get a better model and you know, and we get a better world. So thank you very much. I don't think there are I don't think there are any questions. But I do have a I do have a comment on the on uh, Phil's uh, talk actually af after I heard the Richard Hattersley talked about Cartopie last year. He said it, he intended it to be the, the successor to Basemap. And so um, I fired off an email to, uh, to Jeff Whitaker, and I said, hey, hey, Jeff, uh, these guys say they're, they're building the successor to uh, Basemap. What do you think about that? And Jeff said, oh, yeah, I looked at it. It looks a lot better. Uh, I, I fully intend it. <laughs> I think it's going to succeed as the successor to Basemap. So, <laughs> so right on. <laughs> Yeah, he, I don't think he's too upset about that, yeah. <laughs>